All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I know folks are still logging on to join, so we'll wait just a minute or so to let folks log on here. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Claire Fuller. I'm the Public Programs Manager here at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so delighted that we can gather virtually here today for our virtual orchid tour, an orchid-filled greenhouse. Uh, we hope that those of you in the D.C. area will be able to visit soon to explore our new special exhibition, Marjorie Merriweather Post's Paris, you can find more info about our upcoming programs, uh, about the exhibition, um, and tickets uh, at our website at hillwoodmuseum.org. Uh, I'm excited to announce that we are now offering both virtual and in-person horticulture workshops this year. Uh, though our in-person orchid workshops this month have sold out, you can join our next virtual orchid program, uh, our Orchid 101 virtual orchid <laughs> horticulture how-to on Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday, March 12th at 1.30. Uh, so you can take a look at our upcoming programs on our website, again, at hillwoodmuseum.org, and I'll place the links to these um, our programs page as well as the next virtual program uh, in the chat below. So our wonderful, wonderful horticulturist and volunteer manager, Drew Asbury, joined Hillwood in 2012 and is responsible for the greenhouses, the cutting garden, and the horticulture volunteer program. Uh, Drew has worked professionally in the horticulture industry for nearly 20 years in a variety of positions, including garden center sales, greenhouse growing, and landscape management and design. Drew graduated from the Longwood Gardens Professional Gardener Training Program in 2006, and completed a master's degree in sustainable garden design from the George Washington University in 2020. So before we get started here, uh, just a couple of quick notes about today's program. Drew will bring the orchid-filled greenhouses at Hillwood to you in this beautifully illustrated uh, virtual tour, which should be about 20 to 30 minutes long. Via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens, please submit any questions that you have as they cross your mind, I'll read questions aloud to Drew at the end of the tour when we, uh, he will answer any and all questions that you have. So it's now my pleasure to pass this over to Drew Asbury. Well, thank you, Claire, for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual orchid tour. So again, my name is Drew Asbury, and I'm honored to speak to you today about the tradition of growing orchids here at Hillwood. But first, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Hillwood, uh, we are located in Northwest Washington, DC, and we are the former home of Marjorie Merriweather Post, who lived here at Hillwood during the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and all the while, she was planning for Hillwood to become her lasting legacy and one to be open and shared to the public upon her passing in the early 1970s. So visitors today to Hillwood inside the mansion get to enjoy Marjorie Post uh, magnificent collections of 18th century French decorative arts, as well as Russian imperial art. Uh, but at the same time, they also get to step inside of a kitchen in a butler's pantry uh, right out of the 1950s era. So there's a little bit for everyone to see here at Hillwood. Uh, Marjorie Post was a mother, a businesswoman, a philanthropist. Uh, she was certainly a legendary entertainer in the DC circuit. Uh, but most closely related to our talk today is that she was a collector of many, many things, including orchids. So here today, uh, we're going to talk about her love affair of orchids, when uh, during her time here at Hillwood, she amassed a collection of nearly 2,000 plants. Um, and here we can see Marjorie Post in that bottom left-hand corner. Um, here we see her on her honeymoon cruise with husband Herbert May. And there you can see she's wearing quite an elaborate corsage. Uh, composed of her favorite flower of all, the Cattleya, uh, which is an orchid. And up there on the top left photo, there's a current day photo of the Cattleya, but those were her favorite flowers. Um, as for uh, Hillwood's outdoor property, we are 25 acres in total, about half of which is maintained garden spaces and the other half 
are just natural woodlands. So the vast majority of our gardens are laid out as a series of garden rooms in what we call our formal garden areas. And that's predominantly everything you see in that photo on like the right two thirds of the photo. Uh, that's our formal gardens. But today we're actually gonna explore the greenhouses off to the left side of the photo, which was part of the non-formal part of the gardens. So the greenhouses during the days of Marjorie Post, they were situated on the service side of the property or the working side. This is where the staff worked. This is where the staff had some housing. This was garages, workshops, spaces like these. These were all considered to be the working parts of the estate. So in these vintage photos here uh, from the era of Marjorie Post, you know, we can see here the greenhouses on the left, uh, just absolutely filled with cymbidiums, right? But yet in her days, you know, the greenhouses, again, being on the staff side of the property, they weren't necessarily off limits to her guests, you know, but this behind the scenes area, you know, most of her visitors would not have seen the greenhouses, but so rather, plants would be grown in the greenhouse like these cymbidium orchids. And then when in bloom, they would be moved over to uh, the mansion and put into these large interior displays inside, inside the house for her and her guests to enjoy. So here, a couple more uh, vintage photographs. Uh, we see these really elaborate displays just inside the mansion's entry hall. So these displays would have been some of the very first things that her visitors would see as they enter the front doors of the house, right? And so even in today's standards, these are fairly elaborate displays of orchids. And I can see um, different examples of cattleyas, dendrobiums, phalaenopsis, cymbidiums, um, maybe some oncidiums in there, right? There's a lot of different types of orchids uh, seen in these photos. But it was really in her breakfast room where the orchid displays really were the most extravagant. This is a little tiny room just off to the side of the formal dining room where Marjorie had quite a few meals. Um, and here we can see in this photo on the left some of some absolutely massive Cattleya specimens in the windows. And for anyone who's grown a Cattleya before, you're very familiar with how powerful the fragrance is. So, you know, the fragrance in this room with this many blooms open at once must have surely been intoxicating and most likely overwhelming for some people. But I think it just shows how much Marjorie Post must have absolutely loved cat layers that have this many blooms in one small room. Um, yeah, because that fragrance would have been just over the top. So uh, in her breakfast room, these displays would be regularly uh, rotated out and reflected with the season. So these two images are particularly heavy with orchids, uh, but we can also see in that photo on the right, some potted hydrangeas in the background, some lilies, right? So there's lots of different flowers going on. We also see there on the table, in the center of the table, uh, those are Cattleya flowers uh, being used as cut flowers in, a, in just a simple arrangement on the table. And so we carry on this tradition to this very day. Here's a current day picture of that same breakfast room where we see in the center of the windows are Phalaenopsis orchids, and then they're flanked in those little side kind of uh, cubicle uh, cabinets are some amaryllis. Um, and then we've started our own tradition here at Hillwood. So up in her bedroom on the second floor, uh, there's that big portrait. That's Marjorie Post in the portrait. And we keep this tradition now of keeping a fresh cut orchid, hopefully a cat Leia there underneath her, her portrait um, on her mantle place. So and if you look closely at that portrait, if you look at what she's holding onto in her hand, that is a blossom of a Cattleya orchid. And so, you know, some 50 years later or so, here's a current picture of the greenhouse uh, taken from the vantage point of the cutting garden. And this view would have been very, very similar to the days of Marjorie Post, right? And so even today, Hillwood continues to maintain a collection of just shy of 2,000 orchids uh, to this day. But really, one of the biggest differences today is that the uh, greenhouses and Hillwood as an organization receive about 100,000 visitors a year. And we're no longer on the, you know, tucked away behind the scenes in the service side of the property, right? So um, nowadays, we still keep a few orchids in the mansion, but the vast majority of the plants and, and the displays are out in the greenhouses. So, so when a visitor to Hillwood first enters the greenhouse, they'll first notice that they're actually entering into 
um, smaller, it's five smaller greenhouses that are all connected together by interior doorways. But what this allows us to do is now we have five unique environments where we can adjust the light, the temperature, the humidity, because the more environments that we can create, the wider range of orchids that we can grow in our greenhouses. So uh, when visitors first walk in, what we're gonna enter into is what we call a warm greenhouse. Here we see in the photo on the left, um, let me get my pointer here. Um, we see some Cattleya specimens here, kind of in the middle of the bench. Again, that's the Corsage orchid or Marjorie Post's favorite orchid. And then we also see some Phalaenopsis. This is the moth orchid or the ones we see at the grocery store all the time. Both of these are considered warm loving orchids. And by warm, um, I, we mean that the greenhouse, at least during the winter time, generally stays, uh, it, get, it gets no cooler than about 60 degrees at night, right? So it's a pretty nice warm environment that, you know, we're pretty comfortable in too as humans. Um, so something else that makes our greenhouses here at Hillwood a bit unique compared to many of the other public gardens in the area is that all of our orchid greenhouses are considered to be working greenhouses. And that means that every single orchid in our display or in our collection is open for visitation every single day of the year. So when visitors come uh, to Hillwood, we don't just have a little blooming showcase, you know, tucked away of what looks pretty at the moment. Visitors get to see the entire collection every day of the year. So I think it's particularly interesting for those orchid enthusiasts out there that really wanna see every nook and cranny of a collection. Uh, visitors will also see a lot of tropical plants intermingled with the orchids. Many of these tropical plants will go outside during the summertime, be mixed in with our seasonal displays. And then just like indoor or you know home gardeners, everybody gets crammed inside the greenhouse um, to spend the winter time and to stay nice and, and warm. So here's more of those images of that Phalaenopsis orchid. Um, these are, you know, again, the moth orchid. These are the ones you see at every single grocery store or home improvement store year round. Uh, they are very, very popular and for good reason. And I do agree, these are the probably the best one for beginners to grow as they're one of the easiest ones to get to, to grow healthily in your home, but also they're one of the easiest to get to rebloom, right? And that's the whole point of growing orchids is to get our orchids to rebloom. They're certainly one of the easiest ones for us to get to rebloom in the greenhouse. And what makes Phalaenopsis particularly nice is that once a Phalaenopsis plant is happy and healthy and reblooming on its own, they can easily stay in bloom for three to six months. That is not uncommon whatsoever because they keep producing new flower buds at the end of their at the end of their bloom stalk. So a uh, very long bloom a cycle and fairly easy. And then, so let me just give a quick shout out to our orchid staff and volunteers. Here in the black sweatshirt, we see Andrew Bainenball. He's Hillwood's orchid and tropical plant specialist. He does the maintaining of all the daily affairs of the displays. Here we can see him working alongside an orchid volunteer. Uh, they're creating this topiary uh, of Phalaenopsis. And there in that photo on the right, you can see that same uh, structure, the same topiary ball, about four years later. So I think this might be at six year for now and still going strong. But um, we uh, give kudos to all of our volunteers. We have about a dozen volunteers each week helping inside the orchid uh, greenhouses. So just going back to our tour here, um, here are uh, more examples of that Cattleya. Again, this was Marjorie Post's most um, favorite uh, plant of all. And the thing with Cattleyas is that there are so many species uh, that are very closely related and that they all interbreed fairly easy. So what's happened, Mother Nature does this a bit, but it's really humans and orchid breeders um, have made thousands and thousands of hybrids. So that what's happened is that it's we just classify a lot of different uh, plants together as what we call the Cattleya Alliance. But the idea is, I think you can see with the diversity here of flowers and form, um, and then take on top of that, that these have some of the most intense fragrance of all the orchids. I think we could see why this could become uh, Marjorie Post's favorite. And it certainly is still a favorite for us today. And the Cattleya collection is probably our single most biggest collection when we're talking about different types of orchids. So while Cattleyas don't necessarily bloom for as long as Phalaenopsis, and they probably need, they definitely need a bit more knowledge 
um, and trickery to induce them into bloom. Uh, but yet, because of that amazing fragrance and wide variety of shapes and colors, there's certainly a many, many uh, orchid enthusiasts that grow uh, lots and lots of Cattleya. So highly recommended um, as well as the Phalaenopsis. So our last warm loving orchid we're gonna look at today are the Bandas. Uh, these uh, particular orchids require uh, the highest amount of light of our entire collection. Uh, they can handle nearly full sun in our climate, definitely full sun during the winter and maybe a little bit of filtered sunlight um, in the summer. So here you can see them on the right. Those are them hanging up in the rafters of the greenhouse. These plants have no soil media around their roots. Rather, their roots are dangling in the air. Those roots are absorbing moisture and water from the air. So what we do here, um, which is the same thing all orchid people are trying to do, right? We're trying to replicate that plant's natural environment. So here we will take a hose each and every morning and kind of mist down these roots Right, so the idea is they get a little bit of moisture and then they're allowed to dry down. And that's replicating that plant's natural habitat that has a series of quick, wet and dry cycles. Moving on to our cool greenhouse, this is uh, which houses our um, Cymbidium collection. That's a Cymbidium flower there on the left. Now, temperatures in this house, you know, we went from the 60s at night now we're down into, at least during the winter time, we turn the thermostat down to maybe the upper 40s to about 50 degrees, right? And so cool loving orchids are a bit trickier to grow here in our region of the world. And it, it's not necessarily giving them cool conditions in the winter. That's, that's fairly easy, particularly here at Hillwood in the greenhouse, but it's keeping them cool in the summertime that's the challenge, right? Because cool loving orchids dislike uh, the heat and the humidity of a mid-Atlantic summer, right? So, um, so that's a little bit trickier. So here you can see also um, the, glass of, the glass of the greenhouses, right? This is a bit misleading. This looks like it's clear glass and we do have it clear like this, but for only a couple months out of the year. This picture was probably taken in February, uh, but by March 1st each year, including it's already been done, it's already done this year, we will take a white latex paint and, sp and literally spray the outside of the greenhouse and paint it white for the summertime. That not only uh, decreases the intensity of the sunlight sun, but it helps keep the greenhouse a bit cooler uh, with that shading. And so here we see, uh, you know, besides having winter temperatures in the 40s and 50s, uh, Cymbidiums also grow naturally in a part of the world that has a dry season and a wet season. So, you know, these orchids in particular, if they did not receive both cool nights and a dry rest period, you know, that's the perfect scenario where they might live and grow beautiful foliage, but they would never flower, right? So actually these are uh, uh, plants that we actually move out of the greenhouses during the summertime and we actually put them on our back porch. Uh, which has a little bit of shade cloth above it, but it keeps them cooler. But then we leave them out on the back porch until we start getting those like frost advisory warnings that you see pop up on the television. What's that in about October, November in this region of the world. That's when we will, we will leave them out so they get all that fall chill, right? And then when we bring them into the greenhouse, uh, we'll turn that thermostat down to 48 or 49 degrees. And then we also start restricting watering on these plants, right? So now they're gonna be inside during the winter time. They've got pretty chilly conditions. Now we're also decreasing their water intake, right? So the idea is, right, it's those two tricks together, uh, which will often help that orchid decide, say, hey, let me stop growing foliage and let me go and bloom, right? So uh, again, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to recreate that native habitat and give them the environmental conditions that they want. So for cymbidiums, cold and dry during the winter, cool and moist in the summer. And then um, dendrobiums is another really huge group of orchids. Uh, this is one of the largest genera of orchids with over 1500 species. Here we're looking at a popular type of dendrobiums called the Novale dendrobiums. And these grow almost exactly like the cymbidiums. We put them outside on the summer uh, in a partly shady conditions. We allow them to stay out until the frost advisory warnings or warning everybody to bring in your sensitive plants. 
then when they do come in, these really do get uh, restricted on their watering. And these plants will not get a drop of water for two to three months. Often they'll go semi-dormant where their foliage actually turns yellow and falls off. But then that is the trigger that then they will erupt into bloom after a really cool, dry period at the beginning of winter, which is why now at the end of winter and early spring, which is why they're all coming out of their dormancy and blooming like this in the, in the photographs. Uh, so again, lots and lots of different dendrobiums out there. I'm a particular fan of that little guy on the left. Those are known as the kingianum uh, types or often referred to as the Australian dendrobiums. I like them because they're a little petite in stature and you could fit a fairly mature plant in a small pot that can sit on the windowsill. What's also kind of unique about dendrobiums is that many of them are able to rebloom uh, multiple years on the same old stems. This is kind of unusual. Most orchids only bloom on their new growth. They come up, do a growth over the course of summer, bloom, and then you have to wait for the next new growth. Dendrobiums, including these kingianum types, will produce multiple uh, flowering spikes, even on old canes. So you end up with a small pot with a lot of little bloom stalks with a lot of little flowers on them. So a good one to try if you're thinking about expanding uh, your collection. And now we're moving into our, our fourth and last um, orchid greenhouse. This is what we call our intermediate greenhouse. So this is for those orchids that are, you know, considered neither warm growing or cool growing, right? So temperatures in the evening, in the winter time, in the intermediate house, stay in about the mid 50s. So wait, we had our warm house in the 60s, the cool house in the upper 40s, and now we have the low 50s at night for our intermediate house. But really, truly, in reality, like all of our variations in microclimates in the greenhouse, they're quite subtle, right? And really, honestly, in the summertime, there's virtually no difference. It, they're all blazing hot and sticky and humid. But at least in the wintertime, we can create different environments. But our goal at Hillwood is the same as your goal at home, right? Of course, we want our plants to bloom, but in order to have our plants bloom, we first have to grow a plant that's happy and healthy, and we need to give them the proper conditions to grow, right? So we need to provide them with the correct amount of sun, water, temperature, humidity, such like that. So here on the left, you'll see a, a, what we call our Paphiopetalum bench. Paphiopetalums are the lady slippers. These plants often grow very low in the canopy or even on the ground in shadier locations uh, compared to many other orchids which grow higher up in the canopy or exposed to sunlight. So here, this bench faces north. You can kind of see the amount of sunlight coming in on the other side of this bench. Well, that's different orchids on that side, of the, the sunny side of the bench. We put our lady slippers on this on the shady side of the bench, right? So again, the proper environmental conditions, and here's the big trick, folks, like, right, the, those conditions, they don't stay static over the course of the year, right? Environmental conditions change no matter how subtle, but it's often those changes in the environment, whether that be the amount of day length that that orchid is receiving or the temperatures, right, or the amount of water it's receiving, that's often is what helps trigger an orchid to bloom, right? So keeping an orchid in a static environment, things tend to stay, uh, it doesn't know when it should do what, right? So changing its environment over the course of the season is ideal with growing orchids. Here's just a close up of more uh, uh, varieties of those lady slippers, again, uh, also known as the slipper orchids. Uh, also considered to be a fairly good beginner orchid. So if you've had success uh, getting a Phalaenopsis to rebloom at home, often uh, it's recommended to have a Phalaenopsis or a Paphiopetalum. They can grow right next to your uh, Phalaenopsis. So another plant to attempt uh, to add to your collection, get a little diversity. Um, the Oncidiums uh, are very similar to the Cattleyas and the Dendrobiums. There's a ton of closely related species that all easily hybridized with one another. So there's thousands of hybrids once again in basically a wide range of conditions and color combinations. Uh, some have great fragrance like the uh, Oncidium you see on the left there. That's a fairly popular one called Shari Baby, which often is, is has a really strong chocolatey fragrance or vanilla depending on, depending on the nose. Um, I'm a big fan of the bottom right-hand corner. Those are the spider orchids with these really overly elongated petals. 
um, that wisp around. So uh, again, lots of different orchids out there. So our last slide here, right? We've really looked today at some of like the really big groups of orchids out there. But we have so many just one-off oddballs in the greenhouse as well. So far left, that's Ludigia discolor. It's predominantly grown for that really dark chocolatey foliage, which has this tiny, tiny little bright pink pinstripe down its veins. And often that's just sold in like a houseplant store as a houseplant. It's not even labeled as an orchid. So, um, and then we have the Dendrochylum, also known as a chain orchid. This plant produces up to 24 inch long uh, pendulous chains. Um, and then probably one of my favorites, that third picture from the left, those are Stanhopias. Uh, and man, it, they certainly put Cattleyas to the test of which is the most fragrant orchid in the greenhouse. And my vote is I think the Stanhopias are the most fragrant orchid, but they're really kind of unusual. They have to be grown in moss lined hanging baskets. They have really large, uh, robust leaves but their bloom stalks come out of the ground. So literally, you know, if you're hanging up in a tree, you know, it doesn't matter that your bloom spike doesn't go vertical, it can go straight down. But if we had those putt plants and big clay pots, we would never see a bloom because that bloom stalk would be spiraling around in the base of the clay pot, hence the moss hanging basket. Um, and then lastly, the last plant we're gonna look at there on the far right, that's vanilla. So that same vanilla that you have as your extra extract in your kitchen uh, pantry, if it's true vanilla, that literally comes from the vanilla bean, which is the same thing as the seed pod of the vanilla plant. So right, of a pollinated vanilla flower, uh, then you get a vanilla seed pod or a vanilla bean, and hence the vanilla extract. So with that, you know, uh, that concludes our tour today. As Claire mentioned, I highly recommend uh, joining us next Tuesday for Orchid 101. We're going to expand upon the conversation today. We repeat ourselves a little bit, but we really dive into the cultural requirements of the light, the water, temperature, humidity. We talk a bit about pests and diseases, fertilizing, the need for repotting. Um, and of course, the main goal of the 101 talk is what do you need to do at home to get your orchids to rebloom? Because that's what it's all about. So with that, uh, Claire, if we have any questions, uh, I think we have some time. Great. Thank you, Drew. Um, and as a reminder to folks, if you have any questions, you're welcome to submit them down below in the Q&A feature of our Zoom today. Um, so I've got just a couple of questions for you here, Drew. Uh, the first question here is, what is the fragrance of the Catalea? Oh, I wish I knew how to describe fragrances, but um, all I have to say is, you know, it just one or two open blooms is enough, at least when I have an orchid, a Cattleya orchid rebloom at home, like it's enough that I can smell it, um, uh, you know, throughout about half the house. So I wish, I, I don't know how to describe fragrances. I think it's, I think it's a lovely fragrance. Uh, they're very powerful. In the greenhouse, everything kind of mixes together. So it's, it's kind of hard to distinguish smells in the greenhouse. But yes, you have to give it a shot. Of course, come out to Hillwood, of course, and put your nose in the flowers. I can't think of any other better way. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, next question we have, it sounds like this might be answered in the 101 next week as well. Uh, but when and how often do you fertilize the orchids? Oh, that, Claire, that's a perfect question for 101, which we spend a whole couple slides about fertilizing. Um, no, you know, in general, you know, I kind of started hinting to it uh, today, right? But the, the short answer is you fertilize while the plants are in active growth. When's active growth? Well, that's typically, you know, spring, summer, early fall, right? That's the time when plants are putting out new roots, new leaves. Uh, then you can fertilize fairly freely. Um, then during the winter time, when temperatures are a little bit cooler, there's less sunlight. Well, then you, you're not watering as much, so you're also not fertilizing as much. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Um, is the painting of the greenhouse a vigorous task, and how is the paint removed? <laughs> yeah, luckily, it's not, it does not fall under my role here. That's Andrew, who, who does daily affairs. No, he literally, we have a backpack sprayer. We dilute paint that's made for the greenhouse industry, for glass greenhouses. We dilute it. He literally gets on a 12-foot ladder, 
and he just he pumps up his sprayer and he broadcasts that paint everywhere. So what we have found is we normally have to reapply several times over the course of the year because as rain comes, it does wash that white paint off. Uh, and so yes, at the end of the year, we stop applying paint toward you know as as fall is approaching. And normally sometime around November, Andrew will get back out the ladder and then we have like a 25 foot long extension pole with a big scrubbing brush on the end. So yes, there is some labor involved, but you know, that's what gardeners do. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another question we have here, uh, can you use the pods from Homegrown Vanilla Orchid to make your own vanilla? I suppose you can, and it's the elusive pod around here. In my 12 years I've been here, I've seen like two pods, and we're growing in a greenhouse. So, And that's with the staff hand-pollinating the flowers, because, of course, you have to have two flowers open at once to cross to pollinate. So, um, yeah. But, yes, I, I don't know how it's actually extracted. Vanilla comes from, I think it's from Mexico and Central America. There's whole farms down there that are just mass producing it, right? So we just have our little our little token, little vanilla vine in the, in the greenhouse, uh, not really but doing much for uh, production of the vanilla extract. So yeah, I can't quite answer that those details for you. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, what, uh, we have another question here uh, from someone who shared that they were in Maui a few years ago and an orchid at their B&B &B had the aroma of chocolate. So do you know what type of orchid, orchid that could be? Oh, you know, there's several, but the one that's the one that's always referred to as the chocolate orchid is an oncidium called Shari Baby. But with that said, I used to play a game when uh, and we would have a bunch of people smell it and 50% of the people would smell chocolate and the other 50% would smell vanilla. I smell vanilla. So I don't know if those two, I don't think those two things really smell alike. But yet when people are smelling oncidium Shari Baby, um, yes, there is a definitely a pungent flavor of either chocolate or vanilla. Right, thank you. Uh, we have another question here. Are there orchids or are there other orchids that we use as food sources? Ooh, that's one I might have to think about for a while, but I think the story we tell about vanilla, it's really like the only like commercially produced like, you know, crop that I can think of. So, you know, with that said, I'm sure different cultures, right, over time, right, because there's there's literally, I think, 33,000 species, or uh, my numbers are off, but it's such a huge group of plants, right? So I'm sure some cultures are using orchids for one reason or another, but in today's modern world, I really think vanilla is the, is the main one. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and no other questions at this time. We have one person who says, thank you very much. Such a great way to learn about the sum, some of the 2000 orchids here at Hillwood. Um, so if anyone has any additional questions, again, you're welcome to submit them to the chat, uh, but it looks like we are all set for today. Um, thank you again, Drew, for a lovely tour. Uh, and again, you are welcome folks to join our horticulture, um, next virtual program, Orchid 101. Uh, I have sub or shared that link in the chat. So you can check out that link in the chat below. Um, we just got a question come in that says, how do we sign up for next week's program? Again, if you uh, click that link in the chat for our next virtual program, you can go ahead and click through and purchase tickets there. Um, I will share that link again here. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining. We hope to see you next week too. And um, hope you have a wonderful rest of your Friday and a lovely weekend. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.